Uh, if you want to turn in your Bibles, you can. Matthew 1, 1, Mark 1, 1, Luke 1, 1 to 4, and John 1, 1. I'm going to read them from uh, just in sequence, but stand with me if you would. As we uh, begin, uh, the journey is more than halfway over, okay, because 39 books we've already covered, so I want to, I'll just silently in my heart applaud you for hanging in through the seven, 39 books, quite, a, quite a, uh, an accomplishment. 27 will be easy. Uh, we won't tackle a book, 66 chapters. We won't tackle a book that's 50-something chapters. Uh, this is going to be this is going to be fun. And I'll be honest with you. I'm much more at home uh, in this arena uh, than I was as we were moving through the Old Testament. Okay, just so so uh, it's going to be great. Follow along as I read these snippets, these opening verses from the four gospel accounts. Matthew 1:1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You hear that, son of David, you think of the Davidic covenant, the promise that there would always be someone royal from David's line to sit on the throne. Mark, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Uh, Mark, remember, taking Peter's memoirs down, the deity of the Messiah. Luke, a little different, very different. You have to read into Luke to see him begin to tell the narrative, but notice how he opens his gospel. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught, you have been catechized, is the word there. So this Luke, we'll say in a few moments, is the only true or, or thorough blood Gentile to write in the New Testament. And he writes to open up his gospel account to a most excellent Theophilus. Most excellent Theophilus. The, Theophilus is Theos Phileo, God lover or friend of God, really. If you read on in Acts, I just encourage you to do that before the evening's out. Op read the opening verses of Acts, because Acts also is written by Luke. And he doesn't call him most excellent Theophilus. He just speaks to Theophilus. There's a, a hint there, writers have said, that there's, he wrote him in the Gospel of Luke to introduce him or to, or to encourage him to consider Jesus as uh, in Acts, there may be friends or even brothers in Christ. Then John's Gospel, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That prologue to John's Gospel. And as we look through these Gospel accounts, even a little bit tonight, we'll talk about this, but John is the interpretive Gospel. John writes, he says, so that we may keep on believing that Jesus is the Christ. And that as we keep on believing, we will have the confidence that we have life in Jesus Christ. John paints a portrait of Jesus. He's not so concerned about giving us an, a chronological or even approximately chronological narrative of the things that Jesus uh, began to do and to teach. So the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are seen as the synoptic gospels. We'll look at that a little more. John stands alone as the interpretive gospel. And yet he brings a wealth of body of material that without what he had written, we would be so much poorer in knowing Jesus Christ. This is what? It's the inerrant, infallible, all sufficient word of God. And our prayer is that these New Testament documents will, will come alive for us as we take a look at them Sunday by Sunday and that our vista, our our view, 
our convictions about who Jesus Christ is, what He came to do, and the enlarging, ever-transforming difference that's making in our lives. And all these things will be enhanced. That's my prayer as we go through this. Thank you. Please be seated. I would remind you, it's a good time to remind you, that the, the theme for this study, what really prompted me, we were, we were a little background, we were going through this, and, and, and we came across this in one of the sermons I was preaching where Jesus encountered the religious leaders. When he said in John 5, 39 and 40, in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, you search the Scriptures. For them, that was the Old Testament. Because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they, these Scriptures of the Old Testament, that bear witness about me. Yet, you refuse to come to me that you may have life. It's quite a condemnation of the religious elite of the day. I want you to watch a video. This is... This is the Bible Project video, but it's, it's, a, it's a new series they've started on how to study the Bible. So this is an introduction to what is the Bible. Just a little overview. I thought this would be helpful tonight. The Bible. It's one of the most influential books in human history. It explores the big questions of why we exist. It's inspired many people to do amazing things. And confused many others. And you've probably got one sitting around somewhere. So, what is the Bible actually? Well, the Bible is a small library of books that all emerged out of the history of the people of ancient Israel. And in one sense, they were just like any other ancient civilization. But among them were a long line of individuals called prophets. And they viewed Israel's story as anything but ordinary. They saw it as a central part of what God was doing for all humanity. And these prophets were literary geniuses. Really? Yeah, they expertly crafted the Hebrew language to write epic narratives, very sophisticated poetry. They were masters of metaphor and storytelling. And they leveraged all of this to explore life's most complicated questions about death and life and the human struggle. So there's a lot of different authors writing this book. Yeah, and these texts were produced over a thousand year period, starting with Israel's origins in Egypt, then leading up to their kingdom with their first temple. But eventually they were conquered by the Babylonians who took them away into exile. Then at a crucial moment in their history, many Israelites returned to their land. They built a second temple, they reformed their identity, and this is when the Jewish scriptures began to be formed into the shape that we have them today. Okay, the Jewish Bible, what's in it? Well, in Hebrew, it's called by an acronym, Tanakh. The T stands for Torah, sometimes called the law. That's Israel's five book foundation story. The N stands for Nevi'im, the Hebrew word for prophets. And this section consists of the historical books that tell Israel's story from the prophet's point of view. Then you get the poetic books of the prophets themselves. The K stands for Ketavim, the Hebrew word for writings. This is a diverse collection of poetic books, wisdom books, and more narrative. And the Jewish people believe that through all of these literary works, God speaks to his people. Now, there were other Jewish writings being produced during this second temple period as well. Yeah, a really diverse group of texts. And these two were highly valued in Jewish communities. And there was debate from ancient times about whether or not some of these should be considered part of their scriptures. So this is a lot of different writings over a long period of time. Why did they put them all together like this? Well, altogether, these texts tell an epic story about how God is working through these people to bring order and beauty out of the chaos of our world. And it all builds up to a hope for a new leader who would come and renew all creation. And then the Tanakh concludes, and this leader never comes. So it's an expertly crafted work, but it's missing an ending? That's exactly right. Now, a few centuries later, a Jewish prophet comes onto the scene named Jesus of Nazareth. He claimed he was carrying the Tanakh story forward. Yeah, so Jesus did a bunch of cool stuff was killed, but his followers claimed he was alive from the dead. Yeah, they said that Jesus was that long-awaited leader who would restore the world. And so his earliest followers, called apostles, they composed new literary works about the story of Jesus. They called these good news or the gospel. They formed an account called Acts about the spread of the Jesus movement outside of Israel. And then they circulated letters to different Jesus communities all around the ancient world. And they saw these writings as part of the scripture. Yeah, the apostles wrote all of this as the fulfillment of that epic story found in the Tanakh. And they were continuing the literary genius of the Jewish tradition. 
They also believed that God was speaking to his people through these texts alongside the scriptures of Israel. So that's the Old and New Testament. But what did the early Christians think of the other Second Temple literature? Well, different groups had different views about some of these books, but we know they read them and valued these texts because they passed them along with the Jewish scriptures. Okay, so we've got the Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures. We've got these other Second Temple period works. Then the writing of the apostles about Jesus. And that's a lot of literature, so what's in my Bible? So the Christian movement has taken different forms over 2,000 years, and from the beginning, all Christians recognized the Tanakh and the New Testament as scripture. And for centuries, much of the Second Temple literature was read as part of the biblical tradition. The Catholic Church eventually made it official and called some of the books from this collection the Deuterocanonical books. Some Orthodox churches used even more books from this Second Temple literature. And then in the 1500s, during the Reformation, Protestant Christians wanted to go back to the oldest writings of the prophets and apostles, so they accepted only the Old and New Testaments. Okay, I think I got it. But how does a collection of books produced over a thousand years by all these different authors tell one unified story? Yeah, that's the question we'll address in our next video. As I said, that's a new series that they're starting. But I thought it was a very helpful, quick sort of overview of the scriptures. So let's get into a, an introduction to the New Testament. The people who wrote the uh, 39 books of the Old Testament, the historians, the, the poets, the prophets, uh, were people who passionately anticipated the fulfillment of God's redemptive program and the coming of his anointed one, his Messiah. All their predictions were gloriously realized when Jesus came to earth. And so the New Testament completes the story. It's begun in the old. And the New Testament tells us the rest of the story, if you remember Paul Harvey's famous line. In the Greek, the title for this particular body of material is, is He Kaine Diatheke. It's, it's the Kaine, it's new, new uh, in quality, uh, Diatheke or covenant. Uh, in Latin, in case you've ever been around uh, uh, Vulgate, the Novum Testamentum, Novum meaning new, Testamentum being a testament. Testament and covenant, by the way, are synonyms. We looked this morning. Jesus said, this, my blood is new covenant blood. And so uh, the Greek work diatheke speaks of a last will and testament that came into effect upon the death of the testator. That's how it would be used in secular Greek. The new covenant was ratified in the blood of Christ. And a person benefits or comes into that covenant relationship when he comes to God on God's terms. And it's interesting, this, this covenant idea is what unifies. And you may remember, some of you were not here, but years ago, we went through a study of the divine covenants. We started in the garden. This, the do this and you will live. Fail to do this and you will die. And we traced the fact and pointed out the fact that God only relates to creatures made in his image through covenant. And while there are if-then languages in some of the covenant manifestations, the covenant of grace, after some, some people call what happened in the garden the covenant of life or the covenant of works, the covenant of grace which came in when God slew the animal and covered our first parents. That's a snapshot. It's a little, it's a little introduction. And we, if you remember the study, we followed that all the way through into the coming of Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of the new covenant. I won't rehearse that tonight, but I just, just want to remind some of you who were here that we did a study on that in all of these covenants. The, uh, the Abrahamic covenant, covenant made with Abraham, 
again with Isaac and with Jacob, the uh, Mosaic covenant, uh, the repeated in the Joshua covenant, uh, then uh, the manifestation of the Davidic covenant with David, and then the, the begin to tell in, in Jeremiah and Ezekiel of the new covenant. It's all, all these things are what some writers call various administrations of the covenant of grace. And you get to Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, and you read about this blood of the everlasting covenant, and you realize that within the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, a covenant was struck in eternity past, which began to manifest itself as the covenant of grace in, in time and space and history recorded in the scriptures. So I'll just tell you that so that when you, when you read New Testament, you're reading about the new covenant. Old Testament, you're reading about the old covenant. Okay. And just give you a quick flavor of this. Look at Luke 22:20. 20. Jesus said it, and likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, "This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood." What we read this morning, 1 Corinthians 11:25. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, "This cup is the new covenant in my blood." Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Hebrews 8, 7 to 13. For if that first covenant had been faultless, that is the covenant of works, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. This ought to be familiar to you. We read this this morning from Jeremiah, but notice where we're reading it from tonight. Hebrews. So it's recited in Hebrews. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Again in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 to 17. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only after death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. And so that's the way that the New Testament speaks about the, the covenant language tied to the death of Jesus Christ and fulfilling the promise he made to the Father. And like the Old Testament, the New Testament is an anthology of books. And they range, if you were to be able to look at, at old copies of them, uh, they range in length from a single sheet of papyrus to a full scroll of it. 27 books uh, have a wide variety of themes written by a wide variety of personalities. There's various literary forms, backgrounds, purposes, but each book makes its unique contribution just like we discovered in the Old Testament survey. The New Testament, when you, when you think in terms of length, is, is less than one-third the length of the Old Testament. And it was written, if, and you'll be seeing more of this, but between about 45 A.D. and 95 A.D., and you already know this from our intertestamental study, in the Koine Greek, the common Greek of the people. It was an international commerce language. When Alexander the Great conquered the known world, he, he instituted the language of the Greek people, the Koine Greek, not classical Greek, Koine Greek, and it became the language very much so, and I said it then, that if you travel anywhere in the world, people who are going to make a difference wherever they live in the world are learning English. 
That's the ticket to commerce. When I was in Russia, I met several people, several indigenous Russian people who were learning English and wanted to talk to me in English, wanted me to hear their English, wanted to practice with an English-speaking person because they knew that's the way out. Well, if you were going to survive in the day after the influence of Alexander the Great, you needed to be able to speak Koine Greek. It's a very clear, precise, and flexible language. The Hebrew language, we've told you this before, is not as precise. You sometimes translate in terms of context. Greek is very precise, very regular as a, as a language to learn. These New Testament books were circulated separately, but they were gradually collected together. And as you watched on the video, it was a consensus uh, as the church began to collect what was called the canon, the body of truth, that these 27 writings belonged in it. Uh, there's nine authors of the New Testament. And as I said earlier, only Luke was a full-blooded Gentile. Paul, the Hebrew of the Hebrews, the Pharisee of the Pharisees, Jew schooled by Gamaliel, wrote 13 books. John wrote five books. The Apostle John, the youngest apostle uh, that Jesus chose. Luke and Peter wrote two. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, obviously, and the book of Acts. Then Matthew, Mark, James, Jude, and the author of Hebrews each wrote one. When you put that together, you've got the authors of the New Testament. There's different arrangements that you'll find if you do studies uh, in, in the New Testament, New Testament survey. Some arrange the books this way. The Lifetime of Christ, for the first arrangement, uh, from 4 B.C. to A.D. 33 B.C., and that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John covering his life. Another would be the expansion of the church in Acts, 33 to 62 A.D. That would cover the book of Acts, obviously, then, then many of the letters, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Philemon, and James. Then there's a third category, the post-Acts, after the book of Acts, consolidation of the church. That'd be 1st and 2nd Timothy, uh, Titus, uh, the pastoral letters we've talked about before, Hebrews, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, uh, Jude, and then the Revelation. The classification we're going to be following for our study, though, breaks it into three uh, three categories for the structure of the New Testament. The historical books, the Pauline epistles, and the non-Pauline epistles, and Revelation. So when you think about uh, the Pauline epistles, you, you've got to break it down to his epistles to individuals, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon. Then when you see his epistles to the churches, you look at Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. And then when you take in the non-Pauline, those letters written by someone other than Paul, and it's the writer to the Hebrews. Uh, by the way, when we get into that, you'll see that some, some have posited that Paul was the author, some that Apollos was the author. It's really kind of difficult to know from a, from a linguistic standpoint. Then there's James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and the Revelation. The historical books where we will begin, we're going to study through the order in your New Testament, the historical books are Acts, then Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of focus our introduction a little bit more there tonight. These first five books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Interestingly enough, your Old Testament opens up with five books, just I think it's an interesting uh, parallel. They depict key events in the life of Christ. Uh, the foundation of the church, the early spread of Christianity. Uh, the Old Testament anticipated the person and works of the Messiah, 
And the hope of the prophets was incarnated in the form of the God-man, the Word who became flesh. We read John 1, 1 a while ago. I'll add to that John 1, 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. They're tabernacled among us. Remember, that's the picture. And we've seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This was what all the Old Testament looked toward. They may not have fully seen what Messiah would be like, but they all looked toward the one coming. Even when you go back to Eve, when Eve finds herself pregnant, when Adam goes in and knows her and she is found, to, and she conceives and is found with child and she gives birth, I have gotten the man by the help of the Lord. Remember that? It's always been about anticipating God's promise coming in his anointed. Well, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he empowered the apostles to spread the glad tidings of salvation, beginning in Jerusalem, then Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, so that they invaded the Roman world with the gospel. They invaded the invaders with the message of peace. As far as the Pauline epistles go, Paul's collection of letters, they develop uh, What's one writer that I found called seed doctrines in the Gospels? Justification, sanctification, conversion. When you read Paul's letters, you're, you're reading about that, about sin, about man, about Trinity, about the work of Jesus, the person and work of Christ and salvation. And in attending that, it's, they're not just doctrinal treatises. And if you've, if you've done any study at all in the, in the writings of Paul, you know that you can look at places like Ephesians, Romans, Colossians, where you have this, the early portion is called the, the doctrinal, or you may hear people say doctrinal portion. And then the portion is, is the practical. And it doesn't mean the early portion is not practical or that the latter portion is not doctrinal. What it means is there's more of an emphasis. It, just for one example. Romans. When you get to Romans 11, uh, my, again, my professor Curtis Vaughn uh, said, when you get to Romans 11, you're standing on the Mount Everest of Paul's writings and of the gospel. And you're gazing over all these doctrines he's written about, about sin, uh, total uh, universal depravity, righteousness, justification, Communion, union, sanctification, uh, election. Just He goes through all these things. All right. So there you are. Head into Romans 12. Now you clearly, in Romans 1, 1 through 11, you have stood in a, in a specifically uh, heavily doctrinal atmosphere. Step into chapter 12. What do you have? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, in view of God's mercies, that you keep on presenting yourselves as living sacrifices, completely acceptable to God, and that you stop being conformed, stop trying to act, dress, look like the world, and keep on being transformed, that metamorphosis from the inside out, and that's just, a, just an obvious example. 1 through 11, doctrine. 12 and following, practical implications and application of doctrine. Paul wrote nine letters to churches and four to individuals as he sought to instruct, correct, and encourage believers throughout the Roman Empire. He wanted Christians to base their practice upon the reality of their position in Christ. And we're seeing that, I hope you're seeing that in Corinthians, where he is dealing, uh, Corinth is a Roman province. The people are pagan. And he's challenging them to live exclusively, intentionally, specifically as followers of Jesus Christ. Then you have the non-Pauline epistles and the book of the Revelation. Peter, John, James, and the author of Hebrews dealt frankly and firmly with a multitude of problems creeping into the churches. They pointed to the person and power of the resurrected Christ as the believer's source of life and godliness. The Revelation is a fitting conclusion to the New Testament. It looks ahead to the hope of Christ's return, to the vindication of God's righteousness, the culmination of his eternal plan in the new heavens 
and the new earth. Okay. So we're going to move a little more specifically now for the remainder of our time to these historical books as we prepare next week to step into the Gospel of Matthew. The four Gospel accounts, by the way, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, comprise about 46% of the New Testament. So almost half the New Testament is taken up in these four accounts. And you add the book of Acts to it, which is the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles in the early church, then it goes up to 60%. The historical books comprise 60% of the New Testament. The early church placed the Gospels at the beginning of the New Testament canon, but they were, they were not the first books to be written. But because they're the foundation upon which the Acts and the epistles are built. They tell us of the life of Jesus Christ. The Gospels, as you follow the life of Jesus, and if you remember our studies in the Old Testament, they're rooted in and the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Remember we've told you this little couplet the Puritans used. The new, talking about the new and old Testament, the new is in the old concealed. The old is by the new revealed. When you look at the Old Testament through the lenses of the New Testament, many things open up. That's why, by the way, when we were studying through the Old Testament, we would oftentimes cite New Testament passages to let you see how, how that was fleshed out, where it was cited, how these passages were quoted, understood. The Gospels provide us historical and theological backdrop for the rest of the New Testament. There's a Greek word, and I, didn't, I started to put it on the screens and I didn't, so I'm going to spell it out for you uh, as it is anglicized, as it's translated into English. It's the Greek word euangelion. I'll just, just write this down somewhere. E-U-A-G-G-E-L-I-O-N. You say, I don't see an E there. That's right, but the A and the double G has a pronunciation of an. U, E, U simply means good. Angelion is message. Glad tidings. Good news. Now, if you see that, if you've written it down, you look at that, you, you should see a word, Evangelism. Evangelism is, is good newsing. It is just, it's telling the good news. You might be interested to know that the, that the English word for gospel is a derivative of the Anglo-Saxon word Godspell, G-O-D-S-P-E-L-L, -L, which can mean God's story or good story, either one. I told you when we were studying in the intertestamental period that there were other so-called gospel accounts written. The early church regarded only the four gospels as authoritative and divinely inspired. They were distinguished by one another by the Greek preposition kata, K-A-T-A, which means according to. So, if you were reading Greek, according to Matthew according to Mark, according to Luke, according to John. I've got to stop a minute because I've lost a head back there. Jason, help me find... Where is the youngest? I may have lost him for the evening. That's okay. It's good to know that my words are so comforting, however, when you think about it. All right. The present order of the four Gospels goes back at least to the late second century. And at that time, it was thought that that was the order in which they were written. Uh, but that proves over time probably not to be the case. The inhabitants of Palestine 
you may not know this, were primarily bilingual. They could speak Aramaic and Greek. And many of them were even trilingual, which means they could speak Aramaic, Greek, and Hebrew, or Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. But Greek was the, the Koine Greek was the common language. And so it stands to reason that the gospel accounts would be written in Koine Greek. When you look at the literary form of the four gospels, there is no equivalent of it in the, in the Hellenistic literature, the Greek influenced literature. They're full of biographical material, but they're really thematic portraits that look overlook for the most part the approximate 30 years of preparation that Jesus undertook before he came on the scene for his public ministry. And they focus on the relatively brief time of Jesus' ministry in public. And even that, John tells us, we, we don't have nearly all of it. He said it would, it would take the, the heavens like a scroll would be filled if we were to write down all the things that Jesus did. And one writer observed this, and I, this, this surprised me. It says, in all, only about 50 days of Jesus' ministry are touched upon in the combined gospel accounts. When you put the four together, they provide a composite picture of the person and work of the Savior. And they give a depth and a clarity to our understanding of God's eternal Son. In the Gospels, he's seen as divine and human, the sovereign servant, the God-man. Each Gospel brings a specific perspective and dimension so that one writer said the total of the four Gospels is greater than the sum of its individual parts. So I want to look at a chart now. I hope we can uh, Those things are the hardest thing to be able to see. Just if you want a copy of that, I'll, let me know. I'll get you one. But just look at, the, at how this is laid out for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The, when you look at a probable date for them, uh, Matthew, 58 A.D., it's general, it's, that's good consensus. Mark, 55 to 65 A.D. Uh, Luke, 60 to 68 A.D. John, 80 to 90 A.D. When you look at that, then just in all likelihood, Based on those dates, what was probably the first gospel account written? Mark. You see, that was not thought early on in, in the study of the gospels. But Mark was probably the first one. And I think we mentioned that when we went through Mark several years ago. Mark, we believe, was the, uh, uh, the memoirs of the apostle Peter. John Mark was taking dictation for him. Uh, where? Where was it probably written? Matthew uh, in Syrian Antioch or in Palestine? Mark from Rome. Luke, Rome or Greece? John, Ephesus. The audience originally in mind. This influences what the, what the writers include in their, in their document. The Jewish mind. The religious ideas and upbringing of the Jews for Matthew. The Roman mind for Mark. The Greek mind for Luke, oh, most excellent Theophilus. John, more of a universal audience. About the theme, the theme of Matthew, the Messiah King. Jesus is the King of the Jews. That would mean something to people with a Jewish background. Mark, that he's the servant, redeemer. The son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Luke, the perfect man, the ultimate man. John, the son of God. Well, when you think about the traditional pictures, and you'll find this in Ezekiel and Revelation. In Matthew, Jesus is the lion, manifesting strength and authority. 
Mark, he's the, he's the bull, service and power. Luke, he's the man, consummate man. John, the eagle, highly soaring, deity. Look at Ezekiel 1.10. He's talking about this vision. We looked at this when we were in Ezekiel. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side. The four had the face of an ox on the left side. And the four had the face of an eagle. So you got, you got the lion, the bull, the man, the eagle. Revelation 4, verses 6 to 8. Before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature, like a lion. The second living creature, like an ox. The third living creature with the face of a man. The fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. These pictures that these gospel writers inspired by the Holy Spirit capture of the person and the work of Christ. The Gospels were written, by the way, to strengthen the faith in Christ, to awaken slumbering Christians, and answer objections to misconceptions about Him. Designed to guide believers into a fuller understanding of Jesus' person and His power. As Christianity spread through Palestine, the oral testimony, the story of the apostles was no longer adequate. Their message was multiplied through the medium. I told you earlier, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic. If you want to write that down, S-Y-N-O-P-T-I-C, synoptic. C S is together, optic, scene. Those that are seen together, they see them as a as in a, in a similar genre. Their common viewpoint, similar characteristics, especially in contrast to, the, to John's gospel. John is not seen as one of the synoptics. He's seen as a supplemental gospel. And so just look at a chart here and if we can help you. And it's, it's not going to be, I'm sorry, that's awful. I'll tell you what's on there, okay? As far as how the portrait of Christ, how's Christ painted? The synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that he's, he's the God-man. The God-man. He's, he's God become man. John, he's the God-man. He's the Word. The perspective, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, historical perspective. They're giving us narrative. John, theological perspective. He's painting portraits. It was my professor, Dr. Hubert Drumright, who, when I took him on the Gospel of John in seminary, completely blew me away. When he, he pointed out that when you read the early uh, verses of John, you key off on words like next, then, following that, that you piece together the seven, first seven days of Jesus' ministry, very much like creation. He's the one who said, when you take the, take the, new, the Great Commission, you be uh, witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, follow the people Jesus encounters in the early chapters of John. And you have an encounter in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, the Samaritan woman, and the uttermost parts of the earth, the Gentile nobleman. John is telling us something theologically. What about the unique material? This is interesting. Matthew, when you lay them side by side, and I've, I've studied the gospel, parallel gospel accounts before where, that are written in Greek, and that is amazing. There are whole sections where Matthew, Mark, and Luke are identical. I mean, we're talking about the same word sequence. So 
Matthew materials, 42% of his material is unique. 7% of Mark's is unique. 59% of Luke's is unique. Okay. John, 92% of what John brings is, is unique. I mean, think how poor we would be if the Gospel of John had not been added to the canon. From chapter 13 on, he tells us things about the, the upper room and encounter that we would have no way to know. And so, uh, that becomes important when you think about how these Gospels were put together. In the chronology, only one Passover is mentioned in the synoptics. In John's Gospel, three or four Passovers are mentioned. The synoptics concentrate on the Galilean ministry. John concentrates on the Judean ministry. The discourse material in the synoptics is more public. John's is more private. That's a that section of following where he's, he's with his disciples alone. Synoptics emphasize teaching in parables. The, John's gospel emphasizes teaching in allegories. The synoptics deal with a lot of the ethical uh, practical sense. When Jesus does the Sermon on the Mount in, in, in Matthew, the Sermon on the Plain in Luke, he is laying down gospel ethics. It's, uh, someone said his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, I think it's John Stott said this, is a kingdom manifesto. This is what living in my kingdom looks like. As far as I said this earlier, the relationship to the other gospels, the three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are complementary. They complement one another. John's is supplementary. He brings to bear stuff that we would be very poor had we not had it. There's a term, uh, one of the most difficult papers I had to write in my last year of seminary was a paper on the synoptic problem. The synoptic problem is how do you determine the literary relationship between the gospel accounts? When, when I said to you a while ago that only 7% of Mark is unique, as you study the synoptic problem, you realize that's because Mark was the most copied by Luke and Matthew. And then there are some differences, differences in some parallel accounts, differences in the historical context. In other words, was the Sermon on the Mount, which has much of the material that the Sermon on the Plain has in Luke, were these given at different times and Jesus used some of the same material? Those are, those are challenging things when you're studying the Gospels. They don't, they don't touch salvation, they don't touch the declaration of the Gospel, but they're simply, when you take the Gospel account seriously, they become challenges to you. When people have tried to propose solutions to this, some suggest, well, it's because of oral tradition, that when, when these began to be, first were spoken, and when they began to be taken down, then, then the essence of what they're writing down is true. They may get some of the details differently. And you know, if you've, if you've read any kind of material on the, on the authenticity and authority of the New Testament, that one of the arguments used when you find some of the differences there is that in a court of law, if witnesses were marshaled to the witness stand and they parroted the same thing, the testimony would likely be discounted. They would, they would see that as collusion in the law of testimony in the legal system. We shouldn't get too bothered when we see some things told a little differently. How do you take up for the similarities? Interdependence, one relying upon another. Luke says he's made a most careful study of what he writes. And then perhaps documentary sources. When I was studying the synoptic problem, there was what was called the two documentary theory. And it's proposed this, that Mark and an unknown source document named, that they just simply arbitrarily named Q, were the basis for Matthew and Luke. 
And then there's other documentary theories, so they start to well, and there I think one of them was a there was a Q and there was an L document proposed where they would would find the parable stories recorded. But when you sort it all out, I think here's where you come down. The most satisfactory approach for me in terms of how you identify with the with the absolute same material and then some differing things is on the basis of their direct knowledge. Matthew and Mark had direct knowledge. Luke is an investigator. Oral tradition, what they heard and who they heard it from, the use of these source documents, there were uh, things written down. And of course the most important one is the superintending ministry of the Holy Spirit. That, that finally the Holy Spirit is the one who kept intact that which was critical to be passed on to the church from generation to generation. We read uh, Galatians 4.4. 4. I won't read it again. We read it several times in our study of the intertestamental period that it was in the fullness of time that God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem us from the curse of the law. And I just will remind you that when Jesus came, politically, the Roman Empire provided universal peace, the Pax Romana, improved travel, the Via Romana, the Roman roads, and the common language. This is interesting. The Romans did not make Latin the pervasive language. They took the Greek of Alexander and made it the, and it, and it is a, I've, I've studied Latin and studied Greek. Greek is an incredibly wonderful language to be the vessel to carry the early writings of the New Testament. Economically, as much as the Romans brought to maintain peace and roads and, and law, they also brought conditions of high taxation, poverty, the people were in a great state of unrest. They were ready to hear solutions to life's problems. And then spiritually, Judaism had lost its vitality. And you should, if you didn't know that before we came out of the Old Testament, you certainly saw it in the intertestamental period where the roles of priests changed. The line of priests was ignored. Judaism had lost its vitality. The Roman gods were mockeries. Christianity steps in to a gap. And I want to end this tonight by just giving you a brief summary. I think I've got it printed up for you here. Of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Okay, Matthew, the first gospel in our New Testament, presents Jesus as the Christ, Israel's messianic king. He gives Jesus genealogy, the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, authority, and power, emphasize his messianic credentials. He was unique. His teaching was unique. But opposition mounted because, quote, he was not one of us. And he's crucified. But the king leaves behind an empty tomb will come again. That's the story, Matthew. Mark, second gospel presents Jesus as the servant who came to give his life a ransom for many. In the beginning of the ministry, because Mark bypasses the, the nativity, the story of Jesus' birth. In the beginning of his ministry, he was a servant to the multitudes. As his departure grew near, Jesus concentrated on teaching and ministering to his disciples. A full 37% of this gospel is devoted to the events of his last and most important week. Think about that. In the 16 chapters of Mark, 37% is focused on the last week. Luke, the third gospel, presents Jesus as the perfect son of man, whose mission was to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, this lucid historical portrait of Christ traces his advent, his coming, his activities, admonitions, afflictions, authentic authentication, to demonstrate his perfect character and redemptive work. And then John. 
Set aside, it's not, it's not one of the synoptics, John. The fourth gospel presents Jesus as the eternal Son of God who offered eternal life to all who would believe in him. John uses a carefully chosen series of seven signs to demonstrate that Jesus is the Christ. Five chapters of this gospel record Jesus' parting discourse to his disciples only a few hours before his death. After his victorious resurrection, Christ further instructed his men in a number of appearances, post-resurrection appearances. And then the book of Acts, a, a fifth historical book. It's four gospel accounts, but only one book of Acts. This book provides the only historical portrait of the period from the ascension of Jesus to the travels and trials of Paul. This book chronicles some of the key events in the spread of the gospel from Judea to Samaria, Syria, and the rest of the Roman Empire. So, with that said, next week, Lord willing, we will begin studying Matthew. I say begin, it may take us a couple of Sundays, but I want, us, I want to leave that open, but we will begin our study of Matthew. Questions or comments or observations before we dismiss tonight?